Thank you for joining me today. My name is Joseph Owen. We're going to be discussing oral and intravenous contrast agents. At the end of this session, you should be able to describe the basic uses and indications, benefits and risks of oral and intravenous contrast. So what are contrast agents and, and why are they important for diagnostic imaging? Essentially, they're substances that improve the visibility of internal structures. And that can be on x-rays, fluoroscopy, CT, MRI, and there are even now ultrasound contrast agents. The idea is that when we administer these agents, they're going to alter the appearance of specific tissue types or structures to help us differentiate the different types of tissue or differentiate normal appearance of tissue from abnormal appearance of tissue. And, and they do this by providing better visualization of the organs, better visualization of the vessels, and also we can image multiple times to see how something enhances in the arterial phase, the portal venous phase, or the delayed phase. And, and in some ways that can help us assess for function as well as pathology. In some instances, contrast will make the invisible visible. So without contrast, many tumors, many types of infection or inflammation may not be visible on non-contrast imaging that will be easy to see and distinguish once contrast is present. There are multiple different routes of administration of contrast, but the, the two primary routes are going to be oral administration or intravenous administration. Oral administration is very important for imaging of the GI tract, uh, and, and then intravenous administration really is going to cause changes throughout the body, both opacifying blood vessels, causing better visualization of organs, and allowing for characterization of any lesions or pathology that may be present. When we think about the different types of oral contrast agents, really the, there are two main types that we think of, barium contrast and then iodinated or water-soluble contrast. Barium contrast is very dense. We primarily use it in fluoroscopy for things like modified barium swallows, esophagrams, upper GI, studies, small bowel follow-throughs, okay, so your routine fluoroscopic studies. Water-soluble contrast is less dense. We use it in fluoroscopy when there's a suspected perforation or patient is post-operative, or if they're potentially going to go to the operating room for surgery on their GI tract. We also use it in CT to opacify the bowel, and that's because barium on CT is so dense that it causes a lot of artifact and degrades the image quality, where iodinated contrast is sort of just the right density to allow for opacification of the bowel, but not cause artifact or obscuration of other structures on the CT. Negative contrast, or also neutral contrast, is used less frequently. It's sort of a, the least dense type of contrast and is used in specialized studies like CT and MRI enterography. It more or less looks like water, so you administer it, it passes through the GI tract without getting absorbed like water, and that allows for distension of the GI tract without sort of the bright appearance of the iodinated contrast. So in certain instances, you can see mucosal abnormalities or, or analyze the bowel wall a little better than you can when you have the bright iodinated contrast on CT or MRI. Here are just two examples of fluoroscopy studies. Um, this first study, uh, this was an 18-year-old woman who presented with a perforated duodenal ulcer. She had gone to the operating room and had that repaired. And uh, this was a post-operative study to see if there was a persistent leak. And so we administered iodinated contrast. Again, it's a post-operative patient, the suspected leak. We don't want to give them barium, okay? So we give them iodinated contrast. And in this case, um, we see accumulation of contrast outside of the lumen of the duodenum. And so that is consistent with a leak. And so, you know, in a patient with a suspected leak, when, we, when iodinated contrast does leak from the bowel, our body is able to easily resorb that water-soluble iodinated contrast, where if this had been barium and it leaked outside of the GI tract, our body is not able to resorb that barium. And so you can get sort of concretion of the barium and it can result in inflammation and, and fibrosis. So you don't want to use barium if you suspect a leak. Now, why do we use barium at all? Well, barium is very good at coating the mucosa of the bowel and it is more dense. So uh, in routine studies where we're wanting to assess the mucosa of the esophagus or the mucosa of the stomach, we will administer barium because it gives us very nice opacification of the bowel and it will even coat the surfaces of the bowel so that we can assess the mucosa in detail for inflammation or ulceration or tumor. Here's an example of negative or neutral oral contrast. You can see that these loops of small bowel are nicely distended. It looks just like water. And with the neutral or negative oral contrast, we can really nicely see the wall of the bowel. We can assess for any abnormal enhancement of the mucosa. This is a CT with oral contrast. In this case, you can see the small bowel loops are distended with this bright iodinated contrast. And notice that the wall of the bowel is a little bit more obscured. So if there was some abnormal enhancement to the wall of the bowel, it may be more difficult to appreciate with this oral contrast that is iodinated and therefore bright on CT. We also want to remember that if we're looking for a GI bleed, we do not want to have oral contrast on board. That's because in a GI bleed CT study, what we're hoping to identify is intravenous contrast leaking into 
the bowel, which would be representative of that GI bleed. And in that case, we need the bowel to be empty uh, because to detect the bright intravenous contrast leaking into the bowel, we can't have any pre-existing bright contrast in the bowel. All right, so let's think about and review these indications, risks, and benefits. So often we're going to be using barium oral contrast in the setting of dysphagia, suspected aspiration, reflux, or uh, gastritis. In suspected GI perforation or leak, we're going to be using iodinated contrast. And typically, if you suspect an obstruction or a stricture is present, we're going to be using iodinated contrast. Again, that barium contrast gives us good mucosal detail. Both forms of contrast can demonstrate dilation of the bowel, stricture or obstruction of the bowel. And with iodinated contrast, especially in the setting of a suspected leak or perforation, we're going to have a much higher sensitivity for detecting the perforation and where the perforation is occurring if we have oral contrast as opposed to having no oral contrast. There are some small risks. Barium can cause constipation, so we recommend patients drink a lot of fluids after consuming barium. Uh, there is a small risk to aspiration, but actually the risk of aspirating barium is less than the risk of aspirating iodinated contrast. Again, I've emphasized that we do not want to use barium in the setting of a leak, and that's because it can't get reabsorbed by the body and can cause really severe local inflammation. You also want to be judicious in your use of barium contrast if you think the person's going to need a follow-up CT of the abdomen and pelvis. Because if they've had a recent study with barium contrast, you're going to have a, a, a difficult time obtaining a high-quality CT without a lot of artifact. Adenated contrast is, in general, safer than the barium contrast. It can be associated with some diarrhea. And, and when aspirated, it has a higher incidence of causing pneumonitis and pulmonary edema, particularly older iodinated agents. It's a little safer with some of the newer agents, but you still do not want to be administering iodinated contrast orally in patients at risk for aspiration. Now let's switch gears and talk about intravenous contrast. So this is contrast, right, that we're going to inject directly into a vein, typically an IV, an anticubital fossa, or a central venous catheter. So a pick line, a tunneled line, a port catheter, um, so, some sort of central venous catheter. Um, this typically is going to be power injected. So we actually load the contrast into a syringe that goes into a little pump that will pump the contrast into the patient's vessel. And then we wait a certain period of time after administering the contrast to then image the patient. And that allows us to get different phases of contrast, such as an arterial phase or a portal venous phase or a delayed phase. And that can help with characterization of pathology. When we're talking about CT, we're gonna be using iodinated contrast. Okay, so iodinated CT contrast. And that's used for CT. It's also used for angiography. So like cardiologists, interventional radiologists, vascular surgeons in angio suite. When we're thinking about MRI imaging, we're going to be using a very different type of contrast. It's, it's called a gadolinium-based contrast, so there's no iodine in it. Um, it's exclusively used for MRI imaging, and the gadolinium just alters the signal of the protons in the MRI that cause protons that are close to the gadolinium to be very bright. So we can see um, examples here. This is a CT with contrast. You can see that the heart is opacified with the contrast. We can see the aorta here is opacified, and we get a little bit of the liver there. Just like on the CT, when we're looking at an MRI, we can see once you've administered gadolinium, um, the blood will be bright. So the blood within the heart is nice and bright and the aorta is very nice and bright. So both iodinated contrast and gadolinium contrast serve a very similar purpose. Uh, just one is used for CT or angiography and the other is used for MRI. Here is an example of a non-contrast T1 weighted MRI. You can see that the vessels are very dark. The organs are dark. Okay, we don't see any uh, opacification of vessels. Once we administer contrast, this is actually a portal venous phase. Um, we can see the portal vein opacifying, IVC, the aorta. We can see that the organs get brighter. Okay. This is an example of a non-contrast CT. Again, aorta is dark, not much soft tissue differentiation in the liver or the spleen. Once we administer contrast, we can see the aorta, the IBC are bright. We can see the hepatic veins traveling through the liver. Okay, we can see the spleen very nicely, much brighter than it was here. And by enhancing the solid organs, any abnormalities such as inflammation or tumor will often enhance differently than the normal background of the solid organ and therefore will become much more conspicuous. Let's think about some of the indications. So for IV, Iodinated contrast, um, we're going to be using that a lot in the setting of trauma with suspected vascular pathology. We're going to be using it for cancer staging. We use it to detect infection or inflammation, and that could be in, in, the, in the neck, in the bones, in the lung, uh, in the abdomen or pelvis. And we'll use it to characterize different types of tumors. It provides good opacification of the vessels. It creates good solid organ enhancement and allows us to characterize different lesions. There are some risks to it. Um, one of the things that we encounter pretty commonly are allergic reactions. Luckily, most of those reactions are very mild and not life-threatening, but some people do have severe anaphylactic-like reactions to iodinated contrast. There is a small risk of what's called contrast-induced nephropathy. So in patients with some underlying renal impairment, the 
iodinated contrast can cause additional renal dysfunction. It's relatively uncommon. It's a little bit more of a risk in patients with acute kidney injury or with late stage chronic kidney disease. There is also a risk of extravasation, especially when administering con iodinated contrast through an IV. Um, that's because it's usually a relatively high volume of fluid. And if the IV blows or the vein blows, uh, a lot of fluid concentrated in the soft tissues can cause uh, injury, to ischemic injury to the soft tissues due to pressure and, and compartment syndrome like uh, pathology. Very commonly, patients will report some warmth or flushing with IV iodinated contrast. And that's really uh, of no concern, um, but it's something to just reassure the patient that that's normal. With gadolinium contrast, um, we use that often with characterizing brain tumors on brain MRI, detecting and following multiple sclerosis, trying to characterize the presence of soft tissue infections or osteomyelitis. Uh, it's good for vascular imaging, looking for vascular injury or stenosis, and we use it a lot for tumor characterization. It provides very good soft tissue and vessel differentiation. Um, and, and, and so most studies besides routine spine imaging and routine joint imaging, we are almost always going to be preferring to use gadolinium contrast with MRI. There are allergic-like reactions, um, but they're much rarer than you see with iodinated contrast. In terms of how to approach the use of contrast, when to use it, whether to use it, it's important to be aware of different patient factors such as allergies, renal dysfunction, medications in pregnancy, um, which can all sort of alter the risk profile of the different types of contrast. If there are contraindications or things that put the patient at increased risk, you want to obtain informed consent before giving them iodinated contrast or gadolinium contrast. If the patient has reported or documented prior reactions, you may consider pre-medication with steroids and Benadryl. And there are uh, both a sort of non-emergent sort of 13 hour protocol for pre-medication and then a more urgent or emergent sort of four or five hour protocol for pre-medication. And that is available. Um, and you can always call the radiologist to get more information on that. You do want to ensure proper hydration, especially related to iodinated contrast. You want to monitor your patients after they receive contrast so you can detect any reactions early and treat them uh, before the, they become very serious. And if a p reaction does occur, you do want to document that reaction and, and what was administered um, so that you know any you know, future risk for contrast administration. So what are some conclusions? You know, contrast is an essential tool in imaging. We use it, we have much more, many more contrast enhanced studies than non-contrast studies. It's really vital for the diagnosis of many different types of pathology. Again, it's important to, you know, just have a basic understanding of the different types of oral and IV contrast, why we use them and when there are and what risks are present. Um, you do want to prioritize patient safety so that patients need to be screened and selected appropriately, prepare, be prepared for any reactions. But in general, the benefits are going to outweigh the risks. And if there's ever any question or concern, feel free to consult radiology. Pick up the phone, give us a call, give us an epic chat, and we'd be happy to help clarify any confusion related to contrast administration. With that, I appreciate your time today, and I hope you take away some useful information that will help you better serve your patients. Have a nice day.